<coughs> Alright, uh, can anyone hear me? Okay, I'm recording. Cool. Um, so I'm sharing my screen, so make sure you guys can see my screen. Uh, so I'm gonna go on to the slides for second part. Um, so the last round, okay, so picking up from where we left off um, on, th on Thursday, um, I know some of you have issues with the SSL. Um, so basically, I tried to actually spin up a new Windows 10 machine and, and install, uh, reinstall my MySQL with the secure uh, encryption, secure password option, not the legacy authentication. Um, but still, however, on a new machine, I didn't encounter the SSL problem. Um, so, but I would, so I couldn't replicate that problem you guys had. Um, and what happened is that <clears throat> I was looking for something to maybe you could try. Um, and let me know if it works for you. Okay, so so the two two ways I mentioned that you go about this one is you need to create a SSL cert. Um, and for SSL also you need to specify the path of the cert. So this is a page uh, from Stack Overflow. So someone's like encountered a similar error here, SSL error. Um, so let me put this link in the chat. Hey. <clears throat> So on this particular page, um, how the person got around the problem was to include another parameter in the MySQL connection in pandas to specify a path to ASSL. So this is one option. Another option that I have found out was to specify a parameter. Okay. Okay, so this problem here somehow is specific to the MISCL connector that is used. Okay, let me start up my Jupyter. Okay. okay, so this is another example of the connection. Um, come back to the slide. So in the slide, we're using is the MISCL connector dot connect method. Um, so, taking a look at that. So the documented method typically looks like this. This is coming from MISQL documentation um, because the connector comes from MISQL. So here are the different examples. Now, there is a um, couple of options here for this. So, so let's look at some of the options. Um, what I saw before was this option called use pure. Okay. So this is one option you can try. Um, the default is false. Oops. By default is false. So unless you specify it's true. Now some users have reported that if they put it as use pure equal to true, they are able to. Um, Bypass the SSL error. I'm gonna put this one into the chat again. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how that option is to be inserted when you connect to MSQL from Pandas. Now I cannot for sure tell you that that method will work because I have a problem trying to reproduce the errors you guys faced. Okay, so now this is the typical um, method, right? 
Bronx. So assuming you're using that piece of code, okay. Um, let me remove some of this short lines. Change this to my password, my PC. Okay, so okay, so right now what I'm getting system, sorry, system not defined. Again. Okay, yeah, that's probably because I already have a database, my database existing. Okay, so the option is to do this use pure equals to true. So this is the additional option you may, let's speak up. this is the additional option you may include in your connection method and try to see if that works. Um, against your SSL error. Other options that you could try would be, let's see, SSL disable. So this is disabling SSL usage. So the idea that the thought I had, if you disable the SSL in the MLK connection, you wouldn't check the SSL cert validity, so you wouldn't should you you shouldn't have a problem. So to use this parameter, all you need to do is add the connection, the connect, uh, add one more parameter called SSL disable, and set it to true. Yeah, and then try to connect. Now, if you already have a my database created before, um, I would advise you to come back to the MSQL bench and drop the schema yeah because i think if the schema already exists uh, what happens is that you will get probably another error yeah you cannot create a schema that already exists okay. so please try this option also use pure equal to true ssl i just want to say what equal to true either one of these should might go or solve the problem that is an issue okay now let's move on to the Oh, someone used pure. Okay, so someone tried use pure, it works. I mean, someone can use the SSL disable and see whether that works or not. Now, um, going forward to the... <clears throat> I'm going to jump to the NoSQL... Um, NoSQL slides. Um, so for the rest of the slides related to SQL, like create table, you can see the general rules here apply um, to what I've taught you about SQL statements this still applies, okay, uh, inserting records, this kind of value still apply. Now, now there's a little bit of a difference for insert record, okay, so if you look at the insert statement here in Python, notice that what happens instead of the values specified, the actual values itself, uh, there is this percent bracket by some sort of like some kind of a t variable then a closing bracket s this pattern appears for all the values that you need to insert into your table so the idea here is well this is typically what we will call in a lot of programming languages a prepared statement so it's a statement with much fields or wildcards places that need to be substituted by the actual value so anything there's a percent bracket and a closing percent closing bracket s represents a field to be merged. Now the field to be merged will be matched from this particular dictionary. So what you're doing is that you create a statement with 
T fields to merge, so they're like parameters, you want to fill them up. And the parameters itself, the names here, can be filled up when you provide a dictionary with the respective uh, keys. Like for example, salesperson name here will match with the salesperson name key here. So therefore the value, and this value here will be substituted into this uh, particular text. Yeah, sorry, up to the percent. So idea is now, um, why do we do this? Why don't we just put the values into to those actual values in values itself? So you do this because you may the data may be coming from a data frame, a list, an n-dimensional array that you read from a CSV file. So this is particularly useful if you're going to read a CSV file, or Excel file, and you have to insert into a table or you have some sort of uh, data that you've prepared or transposed, transformed, and you want to insert in the table. So you can't be hard coding the actual values in the SQL command. So what you do is that this statement allows you to reuse it later, so it's going to be for every row of dictionary. So as long as you prepare a dictionary, you should be able to merge the values into this insert statement and run it. So the try accept here would we'll just run the execute statement with the data. So this Execute method from the cursor object in pandas, actually not pandas, in the SQL connector, allows you to take the SQL statement with the data and merge it together. So as long as your data, if your data is a dictionary, you should be able to combine it. Now, the, the question here will be, if you have a long list of data, do you do a for loop around the list of dictionaries, or can you send a list of dictionaries in here and you merge it? Automatically, like knowing it's a list, it would run all of them. I uh, can't tell you now, but I can show you. So, so we need to look at the execute function from the MSL connector. Now, the cursor method, but uh, sorry, the cursor object itself. Um, so this cursor object it comes from this instance of a cursor from CNX. Okay. Now CNX in basically is a connection. So when this connect method is executed, it returns this CNX. Now the CNX variable name basically is gonna store this thing called connection. So this whole thing, this whole method here generates what we call a connection. Every time you access the database like MSQL, Mongo, or which cannot call relational or noise database, you need to persist or use a connection. The reason for the connection is because the connection will uh, sort of so connection holds holds a the twenty connection. Okay, you just will see. So this connection allows you to access the database at will, right? So typically, what happens is that we create a connection, and the database has limited connection. It it is configured normally to maybe to allow a, to have a pool of a few hundred connections simultaneously. Uh, once a connection pool is used up, it will actually uh, reject incoming connections. So this connection is like making a phone call you know, to somebody, so you have to hold the connection in order for a data to pass through, whether to the database or out from the database. So from the connection, you can actually call this method called cursor method to return a cursor. The reason for a cursor is to is two ways. One is to iterate through data retrieve, this kind of pointer. Another one is to actually, in this case, to send data in. Now the cursor can execute this insert statement with the data. So I'm going to find out, based on the the developer guide here for Python. Now the what does the execute method uh, have? So I know the execute method here. I can send in a statement, okay, or you call it operation, and then for the different parameters. So this is one example insert statement. Okay, and I execute the data. So I'm going to find out if can I do a multiple execute with data.
Okay, so looking at what I'm seeing here, it's a high chance you can't actually do a mass insert by passing in the insert uh, method the a list of tuples. Let's see, try try this look. No, this is interesting. Ah, okay. So, looking at this example, now if you have insert books, so books here is expected to be a list. Um, the books here is a list, so query, so I'm going to try read get connection. Now, there's an interesting called execute many. Right, okay, so let's get a connector python cursor execute many. So apparently there is a way to run to run multiple commands. So this is execute many. So you have execute which is given the slides, but if you want to insert multiple, then you have this thing called execute many. Uh, okay. So in Python, you can send a tuple like this. Yep. Okay. So it is possible to do that. Nice. Okay. Uh, for the three records, um. See now, you retrieve records. You need to actually okay. So you can retrieve record now. The cursor itself has a fetch all method, and you can specify the column. So this is uh, this part is a lot like reading a Excel or PSD uh, CSV file, <coughs> and then set it to a data frame. <coughs> so with the data frame, you can actually do the rest of your data transformation functions. The execute uh, also applies for update. That means you can actually do you might be able to do a execute many if you, in that case. Okay, um, delete. Okay, so it seems your execute uh, probably can do insertion multiple. Execute many would do insertion, delete, and update of multiple records. Okay, so here's an example of read from CSV right to database. Yeah. Okay, so what happens here is from the CSV file, okay, get your data frame, and in your data frame, you actually create <coughs> what we're creating is a tuple or dictionary data. Okay. Oh, so this works interestingly like this. So in this method of um, writing data into the database from a CSV file, it actually iterates through every row in the data frame, creates a data dictionary, and sends it into the insert uh, statement here. So this is using a single execute statement uh, in a for loop for doing through the data frame. Okay, I'll probably try later and see if I can replace this with an execute menu. So instead of using a for loop to generate this, uh, Maybe I use a follow to generate this and do an execute menu, it might be faster. Okay, so let's see if I can get from. Um, okay. I'm gonna go straight to the NoSQL site slides. Are there any questions? No, yet. Okay, in the NoSQL databases, um, okay, so. Firstly, to understand NoSQL databases, like the last time I mentioned that NoSQL databases is a kind of structure, or we call it documents. So in NoSQL databases, it's harder to find relations or tables. So like tables that define a key to another. But this is really, really depending on the system you're using. Okay. So the area differentiation here is the model relational not versus non-relational. So in a sense, NoSQL is non-relational. Um, and however, the schema in NoSQL is highly flexible. So unlike SQL databases, your schema once you have created, um, it's almost pretty much fixed. 
That means if you need to add a new column in your table, you need to create an alter table command, run it, and define the, define the um, default values. Now the alter command table when you add a column in in MySQL. The fact is this. Now so let's say if I come back to my virus table, right? So in my virus table, example, patients. So my patients has this couple, this four columns here. So every row needs to have will be like kind of allocated space. Now if one fine day I need to actually increase um in add one more column to maybe register the date of birth or age of the patient, right? I need to add one more column and what happens is that every row would have a new uh, cell to record the age of the patient you know, regardless of whether it needs it or not. So in in the case of MYSQL relational databases to create the alteration of table especially when you have a lot of columns or a lot of rows of data sorry you will need the database actually does will actually take up more time to allocate the cell or the space to store for every patient. Now in a no SQL situation, what I mean by dynamic or non-fixed or flexible schema is that you could add just for one document or rather one row new columns or new key or properties, and you don't need to do that for every other uh that document or column. So that is in a way, a flexibility of no SQL databases. So if you would, you can create dynamic, you could dynamically add new fields you want to capture, and they could exist only for the document and nowhere else, or different different kind of uh, fields. So that's one of the key, I think what the selling points of no SQL is that it has a, allows you to do a, you do use a flexible schema. Um, cost of adding one more property in the uh, so a collection document uh, very low compared to SQL databases. The next defining difference is the you, the way you access data. So in MySQL or SQL SQL databases, you need to use DDL or DML. So DDL here refers to data definition languages, languages that create a schema, table, columns, and many other things. DML data manipulation languages, which is how you do your four basic data operations, retrieval, update, and delete. So this is what I mean by your languages access the data. Now in the no SQL situation, there is no standardized DDL or DML kind of syntax. Now in fact, there is no standardized syntax tool that's like universal for all no, all you, no SQL databases. It completely depends on the programming language API. Now the API here uh, would stand for application programming interface. So it basically means how what kind of functions or methods you need to use to access the database. So in M in Mongo, you have different sites of uh, different ways of accessing the database. So you're going to MongoDB. So what are the what are the different type of uh, no database systems around? MongoDB is one of them, fairly uh, famous. Um, Kind of a preferred a way preferred system, right? So let's go to the manual. Now what other no SQL? No SQL. <coughs> um, let's see. Actually, Firebase is one also. So if you heard of uh, this thing called Firebase, Firebase comes from Google now. Uh, Firebase used to be a standalone cloud system. Uh, Google bought it over a few years ago. So Firebase contains very interesting uh, functions functions as hosted on a cloud for the use. Um, so in a way, you could use a lot of the functions they have in Firebase to do many things um, that you would who have taken much longer if you need to build them from scratch. Okay, so here's one of the database, real time database. I think it is a no SQL database. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Other famous um, providers like 
AWS, I mean Amazon Web Services, they also provide a kind of NoSQL database called DynamoDB. So I'm going to go, go through a bit of the documentation show you how it is like to try to access these three things. Now, if you've learned MySQL before, like if you learn MySQL, your basic um, data manipulation and data definition languages mostly wouldn't steer very far from what you got if you were to apply on another relational database. In fact, it is so similar that probably it's only 10% of it is different. And depending on the features set of the relational database, some of them have extra features that could make your life easier um, could, in terms of performance and access. Okay, so now this is going to go straight into crude operations. So crude operations are basically the bread and butter of data. Any database you want to you want to use, you should always check out what it is like for the uh, crude database, the crude operations. So I'm going to open all these three of them uh, in terms of the CRU, the operations, and you can see for yourself how different it might be. Okay. Try real time database. Okay, so this is I'm gonna run open MongoDB first. So this is Mongo in a create operation. Okay, this is one of the this is a one of the typical methods. So the way Mongo works is it will give you when you, so you're using a library you can using a library you can pull out this object called db so similarly if you access a pandas then you might after connecting you will have this db object so it's different already in the way that you don't have a connection object but rather you call you don't call connection call a db for mongo and then you can refer to the schema directly by calling db users users will be the will be what we what you might think of in relation database as the schema or database on, on the table Okay, so when you connect in Mongo, you immediately go to the schema and after db the object, you refer to the table you want to work on and then followed by the function for table, which in this case, for inserting, I mean create operation, you use insert one or insert many. For re operation, you use a find, right, there's a find function with the criteria. And additional like, uh, we call it function chaining, additional options you chain it with addition with chain it by calling a sub function. Updating would be specific functions like this. And this update many. Deleting as well. So deleting based on on the score criteria. So you're taking experience from relational databases when you say operation you always need to say what is condition. And the condition here is passed through the, as a parameter. And this looks like a dictionary. Right? Okay, let's look at Firebase. Read and write data. So Firebase, create an instance of the database. Okay. So there's a matter of like call a table, which is the users, or actually we call it collections in, in NoSQL. We don't call it tables, tables don't exist, we call it collection, a collection of users. Okay, and then you have a set method here. So this is a very different way, like the way Firebase, if Firebase is no SQL, but it's different from Mongo. Okay, let me look at DynamoDB. Programming with DynamoDB. Okay. Example, crude operations. Now, this example here is done in uh, Java. Okay, did it have a Python? Okay, so this also is, though this line of code, all right? New catalog item. 
So the way Java or DynamoDB works is you create an object, you bind it to your so-called collection structure, and from here you can set different values. Okay, and then save it. Um, instead of find, you have a load. Um, instead of update, you actually immediately retrieve the object and set the values, and then save it. Okay, so you can see that really across when you learn in MongoDB, you may not be able to apply it on your Firebase and other service, other systems. So the only way to use them is to treat it like a library, read the documentation, and then uh, figure out from there. So it isn't like MySQL where, or SQL sub relational databases SQL where you can manipulate based on your basic knowledge of the language. Okay. So um, hosting wise, there isn't really a difference. Um, both databases can be hosted on local and both databases can be used on the cloud. So I don't see hosting as a real difference. Use cases, transactional oriented or just oriented, analytic oriented. So your relational databases are more transactional. So the performance of um, purely creating transactional records, I means you have a lot of data throughput, read and write, uh, performs better when you have when using a relational database. If your application doesn't have so much of a read and write at the same time, but more of just reading, then and then no SQL might be more suitable. Okay. So concurrency control application, of course, there's two 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 ways. Asset is typically for no SQL, uh, MySQL, asset is for MySQL, no, sorry, relational databases, asset, um, base is for no SQL. What does, they, what does asset and base mean? Okay, uh, Neo4j is another no SQL type databases database, uh, also their own ways of accessing it. So I'm going to open up uh, maybe a little bit article. Okay, the asset consistency model. So asset stands for atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. Okay, bigger. okay, so what do I mean with these four terms? Ouch, this is too big. Okay, yeah, atomic. So an atomic operation, right? So a transaction either succeed or go back. So basically it means that every transaction, every operation to a database, read, update, delete, insert, is either completed or it doesn't it is never happened before. You don't get a half half done insert statement. Like you insert four records, you don't get a uh, only two records are inserted, uh, or two fields inserted, the other two just got lost. That 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 kind of thing doesn't exist. So that's what that's what the nature of a relation database is atomic. Consistent. When you have finished a uh, data operation, the database structure is on. That means your table columns don't change. The structure stays the same. You don't have a weird situation where this row has four columns and the same row in the table has five columns. So that might mean by consistent. Isolated. Also, isolation is a very important point of the databases. So because relational databases are normally used uh, for transactional uh, purposes, so you have you can easily have multiple transactions happening at the same time, even multiple transactions happening on the same table at the same time, and sometimes on the same row at the same time, or actually not really at the same time, but on the same row in a sequence of operations. So each transaction do not contain each other, so they don't end up replacing data on each other. It happens in a very sequential and organized manner. Okay, so whatever you do in the data innovation database, it always happens sequentially. No two things happen at the same time. It's impossible. Finally, durable. When you apply a change to the database, especially inserting or modifying data, it is durable. Regardless if your database your even if your database were to crash, whatever you did just now should be there or not there. Okay? So that's what it means. So these are your asset properties, which is Basically, you have four principles to define a relation data, relational database. If your relational database satisfies these four principles as it, it can be properly called a relational database. Now, what is base, which is for your no SQL situation? Okay. So, um, 
yeah, um, don't mind the comment here that it says asset transaction are less fashionable. Um, which is not true. Asset transactions are important also when you come when you have a model that is high transaction based. Okay, so what does base here mean? Okay, basic availability. The problem with basic availability is that the database appears to work most of the time. Now, the problem with this statement here or the challenge. Okay, let me address what it wants to do. The idea that the database appears to work more the time is to address the issue with downtime of databases. What do we mean by downtime of databases? So, databases are known to experience faults and failures. Now, in a NoSQL situation, NoSQL databases, what they mean that to say appear to work most of the time is that remember even that is able to maintain uh, availability uh, in a way that's better. This is very hard to define that actually. Okay. So like it could not be accepting transactions, but it could still be doing it could still do reads. So maybe that is what kind of loose definition of basic availability. South state stores don't have to be right consistent, nor do different replicas have to be richly consistent all the time. Okay, uh, when you mean in stores, right? Stores will be referring to the schema itself. Okay. So what does soft state actually mean? Stores are right consistent, mutually consistent. Okay. Now the soft state or hard state. So soft state of a non relational database, meaning at this point in time, if there's certain operations happen there, you may see that some writes that come in, for example, uh, inserting a date, uh, updating a collection or inserting a document, it may not have entered into the system or committed into the system. Okay, so there's a kind of a soft state of the, the, the system. There are like some operations that are queued up. Okay, so that is typical of a non relation databases. Eventual consistency stores exhibit consistency at some later point. Okay, lazily every time. Okay, this is Something that is to do with the architecture of non-relational databases is that when you send data operations into manipulate data, it doesn't always happen immediately. Okay, but the queue system that's designed around it will eventually make it happen. Uh, we have a lot of this thing called lazy at read. Say lazy at read means when you're reading data, it may not take into account new data that has come into the uh, no and no SQL system. Okay, so this is actually one of the challenges with NoSQL that when you're doing dealing with data in uh, as a transactional because of the source state inventory consistency, it is not good for high transactional uh, applications. Example, banking. Uh, when you, everything needs to be instantly uh, committed and fetched back, you cannot afford to have that kind of lag time. Okay. However, if you want to create a document structure that's that is very easy to uh, extract information. Uh, non relational database would be would actually fit that use case. So it is true that it's easier to extract structure from a non relational compared to a relational. In a relational, if I don't ex extract aggregated structures, I need to form joins. And every time I do a join, it is expensive. Uh, joins take up more um, processing time on databases, more because IO, input, output, or this usage time. Now, in a Non-structural DB like a non-relational DB like New4j, Mongo, your so-called joint eventual state, which is the how you intend the data to be useful, is already there, and because it's really at that state of being useful, it's easier to retrieve and use it. But if you use a non-relational database for transactions, it you will probably experience like you know latency like hey. I thought I just did a change of data just now. Why isn't it appeared for, uh, for a minute? Because in a relation database, it will appear instantly. It will happen instantly. So this is a kind of different use case for a NoSQL versus a SQL DB. Okay. So, so you can see between asset and base, there's this key differences, uh, such. So five broad categories of NoSQL, uh, key value pair databases, document store. Document store is pretty common. Uh, common store, which is like a hybrid between your typical table structure in your NoSQL. Uh, cross databases is 
very different. Ground databases is good for neuro for network structures. Okay, so network structures would be like drawing the dots between a person to his friends, a person to contacts. So a network structure will be good in a graph database. So that's why I mean graph databases. Streaming complex event processing. Okay, so this is totally other totally another kind of systems that you might use. So why choose an OSQL? Um so the problem with NoSQL, why NoSQL appear is the amount of data that we are storing is has increased exponentially. So using traditional databases, what happens is that your schema tables tables get so big that it's so difficult to manage. So imagine you have a few tables and there are millions and trillions of rows large. And in order to fetch data that makes sense to you, you need to join them. Now the effort to join them together for a very large table becomes um, exponentially difficult, uh, more time needed, processing power needed. So you now solve the problem. Intermittently, what we typically do is to move a structure, move move from a structured data or a relation databases joint data that's 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 useful, and then push them into a NoSQL system. So when you access it, it's all like, it's nicely uh, built up together. Okay, so one of the databases we'll try here in the class will be MongoDB. Okay, so MongoDB, it forms around the idea of not uh, still a database, a database is a basic structure. Uh, however, what we call, uh, what we have called tables in Relation databases, we don't call them tables, we call them collections. And a collection can have nested collections. And a collection, basically, a collection of, let's say, patients. Each patient will be considered a document. So think of database has many collections. Collections has many collections, nested collections, or each collection can have many documents. Okay. To install MongoDB server, yeah, so this is the part to install. Okay, so I will encourage you to go to the link. Um, this link is should be relatively new. Now, when you're installing MongoDB, I'll you know just do this and record. So let me start up my machine. So the version of MongoDB that you want to install is technically the community edition. So there are two links to to install. One is the database itself, second is the GUI. So a GUI I would prefer to use, uh, the, normally they will recommend on the site, it's called Compass. You can also access the MongoDB on the command line, which is a bit more hardcore, because you need to type out everything. Uh, not too bad, but you can, you know, try and practice. So right now I'll run through uh, installation quickly, and then some of the kind of comments from, from Pandas. Okay, so what in the slide actually gives you a lot of the command line uh, um, operations. Okay, but what you will be more interested in is basically how do you um, access Mongo from <coughs> Pandas. So I'm probably I suggest that you guys read. I mean, this part about how to do the data operations in Mongo. Um, it's all functions, uh, so I'm going to skip to the Python part, which is more important, because in assignment you need to actually use Python to interact with the database.
Okay, um, let's start. Let me make the screen bigger. Okay, it's painfully slow my virtual machine now. Okay, um, okay, download. Oops. Okay, my computer is really very slow. Let me see if I can turn off something. Oops. Turn off anything. All right. Oh gosh. Okay, never mind. Just go to the link here. Oh, I've the wrong link. Oops. Definitely the wrong link. Oh, let me spell that. This is really painful. Um, this is really, really painful. Okay. Gosh. 
me just kill all the tabs. Just gonna come out to this part. Hey, um, okay, get Mongo. Click on the server. When you're downloading, is this thing the Mongo community server version 4.3? Okay, let me see if I can download from there. I think I'm really slowing down because of all the battery life problem. Okay. Let's try to get it. Oh, this is bad. Okay, let me just download here. Um, for those users on users, uh, use users on Windows. Okay, you can choose the current release, which is four point two point three. Windows is an MSI package. Download this. Okay, um, they will ask you to try to register, but it's okay, your download should start. Now, same for the Mac users as well.
Well, it's ready. Okay, let me run this. <clears throat> I probably want to install the whole thing because I already have the uh, this uh, MongoDB install. So when you set up the first time, um, okay, set the license. So in you install, you can choose the complete. Okay. Right. So you can choose a complete option. Click next. Uh, in here, when it asks you for a service for Windows, run MongoDB service, run as network service user, service name. Okay. Now it will also ask you to install Compass, which is the second tool or the second software you need. So in, in case case you can just download one, you install the two things you require. Okay. Then you click install. Right. So I'm not gonna install it now because I already have MongoDB started. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start the command line. Okay, so once you install, uh, you need to run the DB server. Now, MongoDB is a little bit different from MySQL. Since. Let me see my service is still running. So if you have installed it, uh, just know that I was asking option to install as a service. I'll check if I got my services running for MongoDB. And if I have it, then I can connect it via my uh, compass. Incidentally, it's also start with M. So let's see. Do I Mongo? Okay, no. Okay, so if you start a service, you will have it perpetually there, so you don't need to worry about um, needing to run it. On its own. Now my computer is a little different because I installed the earlier version of Mongo and what happens in this earlier version of Mongo is that I need to actually run a command line to start the server. So let me look for my MongoDB which is here. Server. So I'm running a 3.6 version actually. Oops. Okay, and then open this file. Okay, so let me start my command line. So if you're run, if you're doing the installation as a kind of file just now, it should work. So I'm going to run. Mongo. This is my version of the database. It's very different. So for me, I run it when I need to. Um, for you, if you start a service, you'll always be there. So now it's done. I will start my compass. So if you have installed finish, uh, you can launch the compass app. This is on the leaf. Double run it. It's not starting up. Mm. 
in case how <clears throat> Okay. My... okay, so I think I have a problem launching it right now. Try that again. Okay, so alright, finally. Um if you log in the compass, this is the screen you'll see to connect to your database. So it's pre from pre set up localhost port. Don't change the port because that's how it's run. Authentication depending on what you had set up before. Okay. So MongoDB is a little bit different when you set it up, it doesn't necessarily ask you for your username password uh, to create, not like uh MSQL. 
So you can have a username password, but actually at the beginning you may not need to. So then just connect without my username password. See what happens. So if you're running on a local host to your machine or your database, typically it's uh it's kind of uh direct. Let me remove my databases. Okay, so when you go in the database, uh, this is my own project work, so I got other stuff that appear here but you can also see uh, what you got here I mean local stuff so in order to create database you can create a green button here create database you can create a database name maybe I call it uh, data science okay now when you create a database you need to create a collection so this is very different from MSQL where you, when you create a database you can have an empty database no, no tables and then when you create a table you must specify the column so you can create a collection. So a collection is thing you could think of collection equal to table. So maybe okay, maybe I'll change this to uh to infection no SQL database, right? Collection name will be patients. Okay. So the interesting thing about in Mongo is when you create a oh I spelled this wrongly. When you create a, a, a database and a collection, the collection doesn't need to have a structure. So I just created sort of a table, a collection called patients. Spell wrongly. Let me remove that. <coughs> okay, let me create another collection properly. Patients. Okay, so in the patient collection, we will click in. Notice that there is so I have no data in the collection, the patients uh, collections. At the same time, there is also no structure. Or we call it a schema. Let me create a schema here, right? Um, which is what the document is like. There's nothing. So in fact, in the document here, there is nothing here. There's nothing in the document. So in no SQL situation, when you create a collection, you don't necessarily need to define a schema because the schema, let's say, is like mentioned, is flexible. So I create an insert document. If you look at how the join here interprets the insertion document, uh, the way it looks at it is the document has things like key and value. So one of the type of convention here with from MongoDB is a key value kind of document structure. Which means my key is name, okay, can be have a value. So the moment you create a document you can define the structure plus instead the values, right? So for example, I create a simple document with name and age and then insert. So this is one document which is equivalent to your row in table. Now I can insert another document by saying name is Kevin Hs free. So now I can then suddenly declare create one more um one more property or key name, key key that key and value here. So previously I had name and age, now I said I can have one more property, maybe I'll call this um okay. P existing. Uh P existing. Maybe is so you can say you immediately see when you insert documents Every document may be different. The documents may not be the same. So that is the flexibility given to you. Okay. Now how do we like find information from here, right? So how do you create uh, the different uh, filters? So in MongoDB, what they have are the different operations, right? Create insert many read operations. So when you're accessing this, um, you know, I think a question on top of hit is how do I use this function where? So this completely depends on the language of choice, JavaScript, Python, C sharp, whatever code you're using. So now we're gonna use Python. Um, so I will try to go to my. Let's see. Oh, Kelly has a question. 10 Feb Monday got CA2 consultation and quiz 2 or quiz will be on Thursday. 
quiz will be on Thursday. Our class is on Thursday, so quiz will be on Thursday. Um, CA2 consultation need not be Monday, actually. I will send out a roster for CA2 consultation. Uh, but quiz will be definitely on the Thursday itself. Which is 13th of Feb. Okay. Um, now, there's a chance that I may be traveling again on 13th of Feb that week. So I'll make a separate arrangement for you. Okay, so uh, I may do an online quiz instead again like last time. So next one will be okay. Yeah, what do I have to do? Python code. Okay, so I'm gonna. This is a MongoDB. So I'm going to try to connect to my MongoDB from Python. But before I can do that, I need to install this uh, in Conda. So you know to access MongoDB from Python, you need to install this Python client that's written for Python. Um, so the command, uh, launch your anaconda, make sure you image written mode. Me is bigger. Okay. So command is conda install pi mode. Conda install pi mod. Okay. Mm-hmm. <coughs> <coughs> done. So this is the code. So I'm going to pull this one out into the pattern. To the book. Run this. Oh, sorry. Okay, just run this. Um, okay. 
So this will be now specifying parameters. Sample database. No, this is just using sample DB. I don't have a sample DB. I have an infection. So called infection. So my database is called infection or called this infection. Let me try to print the DB I'll see what I get. Ah, interesting. Uh, URL, different ways connection. Okay, I'm going to try to insert a document. So, DB patients. So, the way you use it is this is quite similar to the, the uh, <coughs> Mongo database, uh, com with the doc database uh, documentation. So, insert one. So notice this is inserting a, a object. Okay, so I'm gonna insert. So what I'm inserting is is essentially a dictionary structure, right? So, so a name is <coughs> George. Okay. Name is George. Age is seventy. Okay, so let's try to run this. Okay. Insert one result. Now it says insert one result. I'm gonna refresh my connection here, and you see George H17 is inserted in. Okay. Now um, when you insert a document, will the rule for flexibility uh, stays the same? Stays true. That means if you were to throw in something that doesn't have name, doesn't have age, it will still insert into this collection called patients, because the schema or the structure is not tight. Uh, so it doesn't need to be standardized across all the records. So this is actually what it means in NoSQL by unstructured data. So to the to the extreme, right, you can put completely unstructured data into a collection, and no single document needs to have the same uh, set of uh, score fields. Now the only um, common field you notice so far is this ID column ID uh, field that's been generated. Now ID field is generated by the database. So like any database, every row or every document needs to have a uniquely identifiable um, index or a key. So this acts as a kind of primary key for the document. The unique thing about the primary key here in compared to relational databases is that in relational databases, you need to define the structure of the key, um, which then comes into the design decisions about how you want your key to be. Is it a running number? Is it a very big number? Is it a text? Is it a combination of values in the columns? Okay, so all those design um, considerations start to come into play. Now for a NoSQL database like this, you don't need to worry about how you should design your key. Essentially, the key is generated by the database itself. And it kind of ensures that every record you push into the or a document push into connection doesn't have a clashing or duplicate key. Duplicate key. So that key design consideration is uh, completely, uh, can be completely omitted. You can focus on the design of the structure and what kind of information you need to store in the MongoDB and use in the MongoDB. Okay, so in the insert multiple statements, um, you can try on your own. This is insert many. So in the MongoDB, if you're able to connect, um, essentially if you're able to uh, just get these few things right, you don't even need a username and password, which is a lot simpler than MySQL. You can actually try the rest of the slides here, information like insert many, insert, uh, fine. So you can easily try all of this to get information to then keep practice them out. Okay. Now finding um documents. Okay, because they don't call them roles. So finding documents in MongoDB is different. Um, especially in this uh, find operation operation here. So the find operation here um comes out from the collection. Now collection references to like, the DB dot users. In this case, my my collection will be patient. So I can pass that into a collection object or variable and then call the find function or method. Now this is how the find method works here is that it looks for so the find method here how you read it is that it looks for a username that contains Dora or John. Okay. So here you begin to you may begin to find some similarities in relation to SQL statements like 
or some kind of programming uh, terminology it's like and here I'm gonna match by whether this word exists or the user exists in this list I use it in <coughs> so I can try this uh, particular uh, method here so I'm gonna go take away this one um, whether take away this so in my collections I'm going to retrieve a cursor. Now the cursor concept comes back again uh, from relation databases. So previously we saw cursor right in um, Python MSQL. Now you have a cursor for this. So I want to find patients. Uh, I want to find based on the name. I'm using double or single quote. Double quote. Okay. Name. Okay. In. In is also a in this uh, okay actually in in fact uh, okay now I have to admit sometimes when writing queries in Mongo it can be quite uh, <clears throat> tedious So print item. Okay, let's go. Right. So this is a typical uh search or uh, you will like select kind of statement in NoSQL. So you are finding records based on conditions. And the condition is can be matched based on the column which is or the property. The property like name is a property common and I can do it in uh, maybe I can do it equal. Try this works. Yeah. Uh, let me try to look for George. Okay. So this this here, how the structure of find in MongoDB works is you do, you have to specify the call the, the property or the key in a document. Followed by so the key is a, is the key criteria can be is a dictionary where you need to specify the type of um, logical operation you use. In this, in the earlier case, it was an in, so in you need a list. Now it's an equal, it's a single value. Okay. So this is another option of the uh, find statement in Mongo. And of course, after you do a find, you can print out using the cursor to iterate through the result and print out the that the actually uh, actual dictionary or object from MongoDB. <clears throat> now they also have um, conjunctions here where you can combine conditions using the OR or N okay, and through the list. So a lot of manipulation in MongoDB uses a dictionary, a familiar dictionary and list type of notation in Python. So, um, so I suggest that you can follow the slides to try to work out some of the data. Uh, for practice sake, then in the next lesson, I maybe can go through a bit more on this part. Okay. So how do we? No. So how the important thing here is how do we pull out information from MongoDB and throw in pandas? Okay. Now, the find. So you realize that the find function, a find method, uh, if given a condition like this, will retrieve based on that. If I do not reach in specify condition, just Call dot find. Okay, I will retrieve all the records, which means to say, if I want to put this into a data list, data frame, okay, for the method here. So my df would be td. Okay, uh, let's see, we shall import my pandas first. So instead of using the cursor, now the cursor is an iterative tool, uh, regardless of MySQL or MongoDB, you use it to point to records. So you can use a loop to retrieve record by record. Now if you want to put in the frame, you don't need a cursor, you can literally do this. So using the collection dot find, which in returning cursor, you can convert that into this. Yep, and you should be able to run it here like that. 
Okay, so what happens is collection of find returns a cursor. Okay, but you can pass in a list, um, creation of this out here, this one, this method here, and then it create, converts the cursor into the list and you can pass it into the data frame. So it's really very simple to pull out a value from uh, Mongo from MongoDB into the data frame. So here is you notice here what happened is that because of the flexibility in structure, some of my documents don't have a value for pre-existing. So notice the NAN is being filled in for the missing values. So when you are pulling a NoSQL data in pandas, you will need to be even more cautious with missing values that will appear in this case like that. Now the ID also gets pushed in as my column. Okay, but if you do recall, um, you can specify the index column as uh, the ID itself. Uh, maybe to do that to do put this like cross this way. Can I do it? Got this right keyword. Wait. Is that something? Data frame list. We'll try this. index oops Okay, yeah, maybe I'll do that. Alright, so um any questions? So try to cover as much the essential part which is the uh, reading from Mongo and uh, lastly how to push data back to Mongo. Okay, to push data back to Mongo you will need to refer to the insert slide. This is how you're gonna push data by Mongo. So if you so in one of your uh, in CA2 you have to choose one of your data sort data sets where you have to interact with a database, either MySQL or MongoDB, okay, or a relational or non-relational database. So one will be retrieving data, the other will be inserting back. So you need to use insert many in this case to push data back inside. Now ideally in insert many you will need to provide a list of uh, tuples or dictionary uh, I mean dictionaries actually. A list of the sharing value objects to push back. Okay. Okay, so I think this is the end for today. I will continue the next session a bit on Mongo. Or if you have any question you can ask me or email me.
So any questions, anyone? So I, so essentially for Mongo, I don't worry so much about the the actual update, delete, and final operations. Uh, focus. I suggest you focus more on the retrieval and insertion of the data. Okay, if everyone is good, then I'll call the session. I'll call the end of session now, and we'll catch up again uh, on Thursday. Okay, I'll upload the recording. I think the last lesson I didn't upload uh, as well as this one. The link.